Welcome to Intentional Divorce Insights. I'm Leah Hadley, Certified Divorce Financial Analyst, Accredited Financial Counselor, and the founder of Intentional Divorce Solutions. I'll be your guide through the complexities of divorce, finance, and emotional wellness. Join me as we uncover practical tips and empowering insights to help you navigate your divorce with clarity and intention. Hi there, and welcome back to Intentional Divorce Insights. We are so happy that you are here. We have a fantastic guest with us today. This is Charles Jamison, who has been in the industry for a very long time. I'm going to let him share a little bit of about his background, but we've included his bio, which is very impressive, below in the show notes. So be sure to check that out. Charles, welcome, and thank you for being here with us. Lee, thank you so much for the pleasure and privilege of being here. If you're looking a little bit about my background, I've been practicing divorce work primarily for about 40 years. My office is located in the state of Florida. I'm board certified by the Florida Bar as an expert in marital and family law matters. Of the over 100,000 lawyers in the state of Florida, less than 1% are board certified in any category. So it indicates our level of expertise. In my firm, we have we believe in a team concept. I have four or five attorneys here of various levels of experience. Uh, we basically take on any kind of case, children-related issues, property-related issues, if they're complex or there's a kink in there, as I like to say, we're there to unravel it or you know, iron out the kinks. Fantastic. Well, I'm glad you're here with us. We're diving into a really interesting topic. I really like this topic a lot. It's things your divorce attorney may not tell you, but they should. What's one thing that your divorce attorney might not tell you, but they should? Well, what you should be doing is having a goals or what I call divorce mission statement set up immediately in your case. We know from scientific studies that people who set goals for themselves are far more successful in their lives in obtaining what they want than people who don't. And what a divorce mission statement is calls upon your best self to sit down and try to imagine what your divorce process could be look like, look like and what your process with your children and with each other will look like afterwards. Um, and so how do you get one of, take, put one of those together? Sit down and think about your past successes. Think down and think about your children. How do you want them to look like? I'd like to read to you a sample of a divorce mission statement that a couple has done. And then a couple, there, an individual can do this also. But okay. I thought it was a particularly good one. So if you don't mind, then this is how it goes. As we transition into our new lives, we will commit to each other to the following that both of us are financially comfortable as we move forward now and in the future. We'll be respectful to each other and those who come to each other's lives. We want a relationship so that we can choose to spend holiday vacations together, even if that includes others. We want our children to feel loved and never feel that they are caught up in the middle and have to choose between the two of them. We want our children to feel that they will always be a family. We want our children to be able to communicate with both of us, and not be concerned that they will hurt the other parents' feelings. We want to always speak positively about each other. We want to communicate often with each other regarding what's going on in our children's lives, keeping each other up to date on what the children have communicated with each of us. They're both committed to our children's college education and then obtaining their education debt free to the best of our ability. And that is more of a child oriented one because children factor prominently in these people's lives. They wanted to make sure that at the end of their divorce, they were not going to be attending the children's significant events, graduations, uh, the births, marriages, and have two parties or two families sitting on each side of the aisle looking glaring at each other and at war with one another. That's have wonderful. Now, some people will say that, and believe me, I'm not a kumbaya, let's gather around <laughs> the campfire and hold hands. This is not a kumbaya kind of deal. This is, makes it because if you have something like this, then you have a a, a guide. Mm -hmm. What a guide does, just like a good attorney does, a good therapist or a good financial advisor does, is guide you through this mess you're in. As we were meant talking about before, most divorced couples are in chaos. They right. don't know what their future is going to be like. They don't know what tomorrow is going to be like. And generally, one spouse is way ahead of the other in terms of where they are in getting a divorce and an acceptance of that issue. So given all that chaos, to have a guiding statement that one can refer back to is immense. It brings immense dividends. When we have situations like mediations, or if we're in a cooperative or collaborative divorce, we have a series of meetings together, I make sure that this statement is read at the beginning of each meeting because it orients the parties to the goal. So again, 
That's the first thing. Most attorneys don't tell their clients. They may not even be aware of it. I mean, we're busy, obviously professionals. This takes some time, and we have to convince our clients of the utility. But well, I like how you also proactively return to the statement over and over again to really anchor the process in the mission that they've created for themselves. Um, because I can see how, you know, at the beginning of the process, you could sit down and come up with something and it be forgotten halfway through when things get tense and, you know, all of that. And so um, that's fantastic. Now, another thing I think, a second thing I think is critical that a lot of attorneys don't do with their clients is prioritize your goals. Mm -hmm. Often a lot of people will come to you, they'll come to me and they say, I want everything. Or I want this thing, this thing, this thing, this thing. And when you add up all the things they want, that doesn't leave much left on the other side. Well, we all know all goals are not equal, equally weighted by the courts or by each party. At the beginning of the divorce, and it may change by the end of the divorce. But I'm an attorney. Each party has limited resources. This list of goals prioritizes for me why would you put your, my time and your money to, effect, to obtain what you want. It also is important for you to say, how did I do? My position is if you win your first primary goal and don't win anything else, you're a winner. But also, if you win two to ten and you didn't win one, you may still be a winner. Right. I can't tell you how many times people come to me after the divorce is over, ask me to look things over and say, and I ask them, so how did you think you did? And they say, I don't know. Well, how can that be if they don't have the goal? I mean, goal right. Again, important. Um, a third thing I think is important is that most people come and if they're hurt and injured emotionally, physically, or in whatever, financially, whatever way they may be feeling hurt, they want their day in court or they want someone to hear their story, give them vindication. Well, unfortunately, most people don't realize that you're probably not going to get your day in court. Why is that? Because 90 to 95 percent of all divorce cases settle. And they settle because eventually time and emotional resources get expended. So by the time you're at that final hearing, and you don't have you don't want to invest the money or the emotional resources or you don't have them to invest to get you to a final hearing. So you're probably not going to get to a final hearing. So if you're going to likely settle your case, then set up your settlement conferences or mediations just like you'd be going for trial. In other words, don't wing it. Get ready. Be prepared. Have your goal list. What if do you have the paperwork do you need? Have you had your financial advisors or forensic accountants sit down to tell you what's the financial here is are there sufficient needs to justify alimony? Yeah, the sufficient funds or assets to pay out. Don't be don't be coming into a mediation unprepared. Mm -hmm. Again, if you're that's going to save you money because if you don't settle your case and you settle on the four L steps of two two three weeks or a month later, you're wasting time and money. Right. Time and money we, 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 we upgrade. Then the contradictory is. If you get your day in court, you may not want it. <laughs> Why not? Because don't get what you wish for because you may not want it. Why right. do I say that? Because the people have this misconception about what happens in divorce court. They think that they're going to walk into court and the judge is going to have the time and patience to go from day one in your relationship all the way through to the bitter end. And then the judge is going to take all that information. He's going to, he or she's going to retire to chambers and they're going to painstakingly you know, through the blood and guts up late at night, handcraft with laser precision, final judgment that will solve it. Correct. In your, by your, that doesn't happen. Courtrooms are over congested. Court dockets are overcrowded. Judges don't have enough time. So they're making decisions like this, almost stereotypically impression. They're not going to see the whole real, real or whole movie of your marriage. You're going to see this frame of photo, this frame of photo, this frame of photo, this frame of photo. You better hope they're the one proper frame to photos, because if not, they're going to get the wrong impression about you, and then bad things are going to happen. Right? Things yeah. that happen, bad decisions are going to happen. And the judges admit this. Generally speaking, at some point in time, there's a case management conference. Where the parties will be present, and the judge is present. The judge will have what I call, give what I call the talk or the speech. And that is, I'm going to work hard on your case, and I'm going to do my best. And guess what? I'm going to get it wrong. The reason I'm going to get it wrong is you two know the best and most about your life story in this marriage. You two are the ones best equipped to resolve it. I'm not. I'm going to get, I have limited time, limited resources. I will do my best, but I will still probably get some of it. 
So if the judges admit that, and say right. that's too much, then they're not just trying to urge them into settlement. They're trying to tell them some reality. They're going to do their best. I don't know many court judges I don't think work hard in family court. They all work. And they all try their best. But they all admit, and truthfully, that they're going to eventually get it wrong. Something. So that's, those are the, you know, they don't want that. Now, your divorce will probably cost more than you want. So that means, what does that mean? But more than you realize it will cost. Because professionals cost money. If you have some resources, excuse me, some assets or some income, there's going to be some dispute about what's child support. What I'm seeing across the country, and I've done cases, and it's all the cases in 12 or 20 states, is that we are giving judges less and less to do. What do I mean by that? Well, there are presumptions with the division of, of assets and liabilities, and there's 50%. There's, there's one presumption. Florida recently passed an amendment to its time sharing statute. We use a presumption of 50 50 time sharing. It can be rebutted, but we're starting off with that presumption. So we're giving judges less and less to do because they have less and less to do. We're fighting over smaller and smaller issues, but the fights mm -hmm. are. For instance, we can formulize what child support is. We can give a formula for alimony, but we still have to figure out what this income is. That's where the battle lies. If you know right. the professional, there's many ways one can generate income that doesn't get looked at by the IRS, either by most most other people. That's income, according to the statutes in most states. It's got to be drilled out or ferreted out, put in put into the income call. That's a danger fight. Maybe some issues about what is this trust or is this inheritance to the commingle problem. So there may be asset trust there. And there will always be, even if there's presumptions of time sharing, there will always be these issues coming about kids. But if one of the parents has a drug issue, well, we say we can prove that. It costs money to prove that. It's not like you can walk in, you have these rules of evidence that like a sit, so that only the best evidence gets through. Well, it keeps a lot of evidence out of the court. So it's not like you can walk in and tell the whole story by yourself. You have to tell the story through bits and pieces. Those bits and pieces cost money, you can tell me. So how do we try to constrict that money? We try to get people on the settlement track as much as we can. How much should they fight? What are we really fighting about? If you have a $2.5 million estate and the only thing that costs about $200,000, you better not be paying a whole lot of money to get this thing resolved. Or if you get all the kids' issues worked out, and the income worked out, and we're fussing over some keys or souvenirs from trips from long ago, what are we doing? And I am a pet lover. I'm a board, board of a non-kill animal shelter here in Northern Palm Beach County. I don't know how many times people come in and they want custody of visitation things for their pets. pets yeah. Most almost every jurisdiction on property. Now, I would kill me to give up my dog. But I know, and I know the emotional attachment. But judges are not going to tolerate, generally speaking, trying to enforce a visitation schedule for an animal because it's property. If you can't, someone's got to own it and it's going to give out. How do you value the love of a pet? I don't know how to do that. There's ways I go about trying to prove what which way pets should go. And generally, if it's a dog or a cat, and they just go back and forth with the kid. I mean, whatever it takes, but let's not be fighting about things that courts were going to There's a famous story here in Florida, just about Kotsky's, where the judge wanted to communicate very clearly where he stood about people fighting about trivial property. He said, okay, you make a decision. This is the middle of the trial, so he saw Make the list of property that you want. And so the list came up to him and he said, okay, wife, husband, there's your property. It's supposed to live. That's what you do. He never had another case like that again. Yeah, I bet. But again, in a brutal way, and it, I'm not trying to make light of people's attachment to things. Right. I can understand that. But the judges don't have a lot of patience for this, particularly if they're dealing with cases where kids are being abused, neglected, and otherwise not being taken care of. To see two adults fighting over a small property issue, not not good. So it's gonna cost more than you want. Um, you know, another one issue is we are not therapists. I'm an attorney, I am not your therapist. I tell all every one of my clients who come in, you are in chaos, you need therapy. And you know, there is this whole issue about domestic violence. Well, you don't have to be beat or threatened with a knife or some other instrument, be in a disparate uh, power engagement, power level between two parties. You can be emotionally abused, you can be otherwise managed or mishandled. It doesn't have to be someone with a personality disorder, someone who's just out of line. 
But you've got to be aware of the power differential between your client and the other party. The client may not be aware of it. That's why I say you've got to get into therapy because the therapist will be able to sort some of those things out for you and make recommendations that you need. Because at some juncture, you're going to have to make difficult decisions. I've got to be sure that you're in proper position to do so almost. Secondly, I'm going to charge far more. Attorneys charge far more than that mental health professional. Absolutely. All right, that's just the reality. They're, they're, they've been trained to help people deal with law that comes from a door. They've been trained and educated and experienced to help you lead you through that, that emotional chaos or all the dips and falls in there. I'm not. I've been trained to lead you through it illegally. We're glad to pick up the phone and talk to all of our clients whenever they need to. But the, when the minute you pick up the phone, that clock is running. So your bill gets to be, if you want to talk, we'll talk. I'll try to remind you that you have limited resources because I don't care whether you are you know, the top penthouse in New York City or the bottom ghetto department. You have limited amounts of money that you're going to spend. No one has an unlimited budget. So I need to be mindful of that and try to lead you to that direction. So that's what Another one, another thing that they don't tell you is that you may have difficulties. Yeah. Communicating with your spouse, sometimes your mental health person can assist you with that. But there are other programs out there, and you may have heard about BIF, B I F F. BIF Communication Program is one that's been developed by Bill Eddy, E D D Y. Bill Eddy is an attorney, former social worker, uh, author. He has developed a system called B I F F, which is brief, formative, friendly, factual, firm. So, with, and he gives you examples, in fact, it's a co-parenting book of dealing with the BIF program, and I recommend my clients get because he, he, he did follow, gives you examples of provocative emails or texts or messages that you receive from his father, and the way you can respond in a BIF fashion, if you have to be the explanation. We hear today, on many occasions, uh, about the narcissistic personality. There's out there is types, and I'm going to get into that as a different show. But whether you're dealing, but I, I found, and if you talk to mental health professionals, during a divorce, everyone gets to be a little narcissistic because that eventually, at some point in time, it's going to be about that. I'm like, what we're going to have at the end? What's my relationship with my children? Going to be like? My children going to be like? What's the real, you know, what's the relationship with each other going to be like? So, if that's the case, and if that's the thing, doing a BIF kind of program from the start, from the, from, from the beginning of the commencement of your case, sets up a way and the type of communication that's respectful, factual, but keeps you going the way you want. And it helps for co-parenting where you be co-parent is not the best solution. But you know, everyone talks about co-parenting and judges all the statutes of in terms of co-parenting. What I'm talking now is the difference between co-parenting and parallel parenting. Co-parenting is that process where you attempt Come to a decision regarding discussion. Come to a decision regarding all the major issues. Check the slides. You know what's going on in the kids' lives and what the changes in climate change. That kind of communication. Some people can do that appropriately. Some can't. Those who can't, the big program is worth one. But again, if you start with that kind of program, it sets the tone for the parents. Brief, brief, informative, friendly. That's sort of a program. So again, it goes as a subset to the, to the adage, I as your attorney, I'm your attorney. I'm not your so those are some, some big things. Um, going back to the goals for a moment. Goals are important because children are important. Uh, things you made, you say, I want you know, good time sharing my kids. Everyone can say, I want to enjoy the time sharing. Well, now we have a presumption here in Florida. Uh, before then, I would say, Really what you're telling me is you want to have a good relationship with your children, so let's talk about what that is, because if you're traveling on the road every week and you're only home on the weekend, you can't tell me that you want 50 50 time change if you're not here for it. Let's talk about making a meaningful schedule that works for creating a foundation for a good relationship with your children now and in the future. Or you may say, I want the house. Now, houses can be a good thing, can be a bad thing, but particularly among women, find that there's an emotional attachment to the house, but children are going up here, I've grown up here, my support system is here, but financially, maybe you're no-go. 
if I, they've got that as number one, my job may be to sit down with them and go find things to advise or they, whatever professional I have a system in case, not to, then I uh, say, is this workable? So they can hear it's not working. And they make that decision so we can put it down on the lower end of the spectrum. It's also important for me because if I'm negotiating mediation with my client, um, against the other side, I, I want to know what the priority range of those goals are. Because I want to trade a number 10 for a number 2. Right. I don't want to give up a 2 for it to get to a 10. And that helps my client. Now, I realize that goals can change as the case goes on. All the sure. clients says, let us know that, and we will reorient. Finally, it's good for just client management. When I say client management, inevitably, okay, I don't care how good or the how well the divorce is going in terms of people not fighting and trying to get along. Inevitably, there will be the call where I hear from my client who's upset and outraged, something happened. They want to stop now, they want the judge to put their foot on the neck of their spouse, push down hard, and want me to be the implement to do it. Well, if I don't remember what the goals are, I can quickly pop it up in my computer and say, okay, Mr. Jones, you can spin. This is goal number 10. Now, maybe a strongly worded letter from us would be more effective than us trying to motion we can save money, and we can be concentrating on really what's important. But if you tell me you want me to file a motion for number 10, I'll do it, but you can get a little note from me saying you need on number 10. Just so they understand, all right, my goal sometimes is to keep you on track. Yeah. And if the house is not going to work, you know, that's not that's going to sell. It's all black. Uh, and so then there's the other final issue is, Make sure that your attorney explores with you all the various vehicles that are available to resolve the deal. Um, kitchen table negotiation. It's not very profitable for an attorney, but it's when two spouses can sit down and work it out on themselves. That doesn't mean it is the attorney will approve of it, but they've at least done, done with the initial football, the initial, the initial head call. My job is just to put it in the language that works, caution and follow the law so they can help them. Knowingly, voluntarily giving up this right. I'm not against doing yourself divorce, but at the very least, have the documents with you by return and get advice before you sign. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, the issue with that. Now, then there's mediation without attorney. Right? What do I mean by that? You sit down with a mediator, with a mutual professional. You may have your financial advisor in the background talking about what's what. But you can come in and try again and form a kitchen table negotiation with some help without attorneys barking at one another each and each and sit down and try to resolve the thing. The next form is negotiation with attorneys. That's when the attorneys are there to assist you during the course of mediation. Uh, the next one up is what I call collaborative for because it's a series of meetings, you know, confidential, done by collaboratively trained professionals with interest based negotiations. And they're, uh, they're confidential on the party sign a full disclosure and have a neutral financial professional, neutral facilitator who's used a mental health professional. Agendas are set for every meeting and work their way through the issues that that needed to have a hundred things that divorce um, without getting divorced, court involvement to the final agreement of the That's a little more comprehensive than uh, mediation with attorneys. And I think it is sometimes more useful because it gets for complicated cases without going through. And finally, we have litigation, which is for people get served. People get outraged when they get served because they see everything now and only the eye for the everything in the kitchen sink. Well, that's usually because you're in what we call it, go to pleading state. Which means if you don't plead it, you don't get it. So you'll see the attorneys throw everything in, including the kitchen sink. The other man has frown on one no, I don't want to really expect it to go over the court of the front day, just so the event something happened, they miss something, and not caught late. So, but unfortunately, what that does is it raises emotion. People get excited and outraged when they say, well, there's an hour. You said there wasn't going to be an hour. You said I could have that hour. Probably pay you out, pay you for what you have. But now it's saying you want the house, you want the house sold, it's going on. It may be nothing your spouse has done, it may be just the return to the debt. Attorneys, but and still clients, but potentially the fact that it's there, it's easier to give up on trying to get something in the list to try to put something back into the negotiations of what's there. 
So those are just sort of some some of the issues attorneys would love you, love to for you to know. Some of them they should be known, some of them they already incorporate, but generally not all. That was a fantastic list. And there were so many just great nuggets that you shared with us throughout. Um, I really appreciate it. Charles, where can people find you? We're located in West Palm Beach, Florida. Our website is www.cjamiesonlaw.com, which is our website, or you can call us, 561-478-0312 is our number. And again, we do cases throughout the state of Florida, and I'm available for consultation for cases around the country. Even though each state may be different, the general principle is always we rely. We do a lot of work in the area of family, children's alienation, or estrangement, and reunification, which is a difficult area. Most of attorneys don't want that to do. So you can reach us there. We do consultations, and we represent people throughout Florida. And we sit second chair of consultant attorneys uh, on cases outside of Florida. So we will include all of Charles's contact information in the show notes. Be sure to reach out to him if you are looking for additional support um, because he is a fantastic resource. Thank you for being here with us. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you for joining me on Intentional Divorce Insights. It's a privilege to share this time with you. I hope each episode offers valuable guidance to navigate your journey. If you find our content helpful, Please leave a review to help others discover the benefits of intentional decision-making in divorce. Until next time, take care and continue to embrace your path with intention.